Amen. All right. During the prayer request time, I forgot to mention that my, my wife is not feeling well. If you could pray for her, she has a stomach bug. That's why both my three of my children are here tonight. So I may have to, re hopefully I don't have to repeatedly scorn them. Yes, sir. The Rays are all family. It's sick as well. Okay, yeah. And also pray for the Rays. So pray for my wife and also the Rays as well. <clears throat> here at Genesis chapter number 12, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1 in just a moment. Thus far, obviously, we have completed chapters 1 through 11. Now, there's going to be a little bit of a shift in the gears here because chapters 1 through 11, they're packed full of a bunch of interesting stories, a bunch of stories that we're all probably very familiar with, a lot of, you know, really, uh, you know, the cataclysmic type things that, that took place uh, that impacted history, you know, from beginning to end. We feel, you know, uh, the, the dramatic changes of, you know, just sin, of the flood, all these things obviously we can relate to. But chapter number 12, really, there's a major gear change here, especially with the reading of the Bible. Chapter number 12 becomes, starts to become very more, you know, relative to us today and to the New Testament. And we're going to see why here in just a moment. Now, <clears throat> just one second, we're going to jump into verse 1. I want to preview something very quickly. Chapter number 11, we get the prologue to chapter number 12. We get the introduction to chapter number 12. And as I mentioned last week, this happens very often in the book of, of uh, Genesis, and especially in these chapters. This is really where this thread, this common thread kind of ends here is with chapter number 12. If you are trying to get the context to a chapter in Genesis 1 through 12, this is what I recommend. Go to, let's say you're in chapter number 4 or 5, whatever chapter it is. It doesn't work out in every example, but a lot of examples it does, 1 through 12. If you're in chapter number 6... I advise you to go back to the previous chapter and look for the last paragraph marker. Almost every single time you'll notice that the character that is now being introduced, or now being spoken of in the chapter that you are now reading, was actually introduced in the last chapter. This is really the last time that this common thread uh, takes place throughout the book of Genesis. But if you look there in Genesis chapter number 11, like I said, look at the paragraph marker. Verse number 27, that's what the paragraph marker looks like there in your Bible. If you look at verse number 27, you'll see that little symbol. That's the paragraph marker. That is to divide the chapters into further context. Now, right there is where we see the generations of Abram being introduced, which would later be known as Abraham. So we get the context from the very beginning of the life of Abram here. So we see that, if we were to back up, we'd see that Nahor begat, begat uh, Terah, and then Terah begat three sons. We see it is Abram, and it's also Nahor again, and then Haran. Then Haran ends up passing away. He dies before Terah, but we know that they started to travel beforehand. Now, I want you to look down at chapter number 12, verse number 1, knowing that. <clears throat> chapter number 12, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now I want you to keep your hand here, of course, but I want you to turn to Acts chapter number 7, verse number 1. The New Testament, Acts chapter number 7, verse number 1. We're going to see this mentioned in the New Testament spoken of. Gives us a little bit more information, something we can learn doctrinally from and apply it to our lives here in just a moment. <coughs> Acts chapter number 7, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. That was exactly what we just read there in verse number one. Then it says this, Before he dwelt in Sharon. Now that is Haran is what that is referring to. In the Old Testament, it's referred to as Haran. Sharan, verse three, And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. So we just read about that in Genesis 12, verse 1. Look at verse number 4. It says this, Then came he out of the land of, of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Now notice, <coughs> excuse me, Michaela, give me a water, please. Now notice there it says that when he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, right? Of the Chaldeans, it says in the New Testament, the Chaldeans in the Old Testament, the land of the Chaldeans, it says that he dwelt first in Sharan, but then notice it says that once his father died was when he ended up moving or migrating to where God had called him to go to originally, 
or initially. Now, let me ask you this question. Was there any mention when God appeared unto Abraham, what we read in chapter 12, verse 1, or even prior to that in Genesis 11, where God said, hey, Terah, Abram, nay, or all of these people. Did, did you read that anywhere? No, he came to Abram, didn't he? Did he ever tell them to, hey, make a pit stop at Haran? No, he wanted him to go immediately, didn't he? He said, get thee out of thy country and from my, what? Father's house. So notice that. And then what ends up happening? Terah, obviously in some sense, and we'll get into this more in a minute, takes the lead. Because Terah takes them unto Haran. It says, and the proof that his father is the one leading is because when did Abram end up being obedient to God? When his father passed away. So what was impeding him or stopping him from being obedient unto God? His father. I want you to notice that we're going to look at that in just a minute. It's very, it's very, it can be very applicable to our lives today spiritually. Go back to Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 1. We will read that one more time. <coughs> it says this. Now the Lord had said... Notice also that's past tense, and I mentioned this last week, that Genesis 11 really is where this takes place there, but we, we, we get more specifics here in Genesis 12. It's the pattern of the Bible's literary style. It just backs up and then gives you the details of the story. So it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. <coughs> and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So this is the very beginning when God really starts dealing with the man named Abram. He is spoken of through all, throughout all the Bible. And I want you to notice verse number 3. This is why it becomes so important you know, in the latter portions of the Bible. It says in verse number 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What we have in verses 2 and 3 is the gospel first introduced in clarity. Now, the gospel has been talked about. It's been preached. Even the gospel going from seed to seed to seed can be traced back to Noah all the way back to Adam. The gospel is preached by God unto Adam and Eve. But this is the first time we start seeing it in clarity where actually this verse is repeatedly quoted in the New Testament, it isn't, isn't it? It's almost one of the most famous verses that's spoken of. But it's also, coincidentally, one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. Now here in verses 2 and 3, like I said, this is the gospel being preached. And don't misunderstand me, my friend. This is the gospel, definite article, one gospel, the same gospel that you believe today and that you go from door to door and preach. It is not in the same clarity that we preach it today. It does not have the specifics that we have today, but it is the same gospel. And how do we know that? From the Bible. We look here at the Bible, we compare Scripture with Scripture, and that's what we're going to do here in just a moment. I'm going to show this to you, and we can clearly see that this is the same gospel that we preach today. Now, verse number three is the most, one of the most abused verses in all of Christianity, really. Because of, I say it's one of the most, I give it that you know, profound of a statement, because of the, the, the vast size and influence of the Zionistic movement today. Zionism is huge. People that believe in Zionism, people that just support the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel today, quote this verse constantly to defend their doctrine. And not only that, I will guarantee you that if you look up, Christ, if you look up or ask even a Christian, give me your number one verse that tells me that I should bless Israel, do you know what verse they're going to quote to you? This verse right here. Specifically, Genesis 12, 3 is the verse that they're going to quote to you. Now, this verse is actually, you know, uh, uh, spoken of quite a few times in the book of Genesis. And there are little small differences throughout the book of Genesis when God says this or speaks to Abram and he conveys this same message. But specifically, Genesis 12, 3 is what the Zionists constantly quote. And this is what they say. Look there at Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee. So they say, <coughs> this is a promise given unto Abraham and unto all of Israel, all of the nation of Israel, because Abraham, or Abram at this time, was the progenitor of 
the nation of Israel. So this promise was then passed down to Jacob. It was given to the entirety of the nation of Israel. And because of that, it says, I will bless them that bless thee. So as a nation, the United States of America today, Christians try to justify their support for Israel by saying, if we support Israel, God will bless us. If we bless them, give them financial support, give them military support, give them whatever support that they possibly need, then God will bless us. Then they read the latter portion and it says this, and curse him <coughs> that curseth thee. So those that are against Israel, and they'll talk about the Muslims, they'll talk about all the Arab countries that Israel's constantly warring with, Syria, whoever it may be that they're battling with at this particular moment. I'm not even sure. Because it's everyone in that area, it seems like, all the time. So here's the thing. They'll say, if, you, if we bless them, God will bless us. But whoever, and if it's us, if we curse them, then God will curse us. So they try to use this verse in order to fearmonger or scare you in to supporting the modern, the contemporary state of Israel today. Now I'm going to show you from the Bible, not my own opinion, you don't need to just stand up here and listen to me. I'm going to show you from the Bible that this is not talking about the modern state of Israel. I'm going to show you from the Bible that this is not talking about the nation of Israel as we know it today. So look there again in Genesis 12. Look at verse number 2 and 3. Let's read that one more time. It says this. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And then it says this, And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I want you to turn over to Genesis 15, where this is also preached unto Abraham again. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 15. And I want you to look at verse number 3. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house, my house is mine heir. So he, this is happening or occurring, of course, after the conversation in Genesis 12, the promise that was given to Abram. And he's saying, I thought that you were going to bless me, basically. I thought that you were going to give me a seed that was going to you know, grow into many nations, if you will. So he's asking this question. He doesn't understand exactly why he hasn't been blessed with a child. And then he says in verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And then verse 6, of course, the salvation of Abram or Abraham. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is reiterated in Genesis uh, 17. Turn over to Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> We'll see it again in clarity. Look at Genesis 17. He says in verse number 6. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Verse 6. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. And then he says, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee. And then he says, and to thy seed after thee. Number one, I want to point out to you repeatedly while we're reading this, that seed is singular every time when he is speaking unto Abram. Now, he gave this promise unto Abram and to his seed. It is reiterated a few different times and it's it's worded a little bit different each time that it's brought up, but we always want the Bible to be our commentary. We don't want Schofield to be our commentary. And that's one of the main proponents of this sort of dispensationalism and Zionism today, and the number one reason why so many Christians misunderstand this promise that was given unto Abraham, or unto Abraham. I want you to go to Galatians chapter number 3. Go to Galatians chapter number 3. <clears throat> Go to Galatians chapter number 3, we'll get the context, and it's speaking of what we just read there in Genesis chapter 15, which is the salvation of Abram. It says this, look at verse number 6, even as Abraham believed God, <coughs> and it was accounted to him for righteousness, skip down to verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying... 
So right now, what are we getting ready to read? We haven't read it yet, but what are we getting ready to read? The gospel, right? So let's look at this, and then we'll compare it unto what we read in the Old Testament. Saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, where is that quoting? It's quoting Genesis 12. It's quoting Genesis 15. It's quoting Genesis 17. Now, if the Bible is your final authority, if the Bible is your dictionary, then what are you going to believe about Genesis 12? That what was spoken was what? The gospel. There's no way around it. And if you believe that the words that were spoken in Genesis 12 was anything other than the same gospel that the church at Galatia believed and was preached and preached also to others, then you are not allowing the Bible to be your final authority. What you are allowing to do, what you are allowing is the Schofield Reference Bible to define terms for you. Because you did not get that from the Bible, you got that from a man. You did not get that from the Bible because the Bible clearly tells you that the gospel is, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Man. It's as clear as day. This man. is not an argument. It is not confusing. He says they preach the gospel to, the, uh, no, or the, the scripture, I'm sorry, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. It's super plain, saying, in me shall all nations be blessed. Extremely easy to understand. Amen. So if the Bible is your final authority, what was preached unto Abraham in Genesis 12? The gospel. It was an unclear version of the gospel. I have no problems with saying that. It was not, it was not in the same clarity that we have it today. It was the gospel, just not as clear as we have it today. You know what? We find out who that seed is here in, in Galatians chapter number 3 in clarity. Look down at Galatians chapter number 3, verse 16. Galatians 3, 16, it says this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now does that phrase sound familiar? The promise being given unto Abraham and to his seed? It sounds very familiar. All those passages that we read before, those three locations that we turn to in Genesis... It was to Abraham and to his seed, this covenant, the promise. Look at what it says. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, get up and sit down now. Right now. Hey, if I have to yell at any of you guys one more time, as soon as I'm done, you're going into my office and getting a spanking. Do you all three hear me? Do not get up again. Galatians chapter number 3 Verse number 16, one more time. Now to Abraham <coughs> and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many. Notice that. He saith not as to seeds, plural, as of many. Pay attention. He says this, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Notice that. He specifically tells you. And make sure that you don't misunderstand it. I'm not talking about a numerous amount of people. I'm not talking about a nation, as in the nation of Israel, as in every person that came out of the loins of Abraham. And the perfect example of that is Abraham ended up having two children. Who were they? Anybody? Ishmael and Isaac. Was Ishmael automatically given this promise? He was not. So notice that even the children that specifically or that directly came from Abraham immediately did not receive that promise. There was a catch to it, wasn't there? It's faith is what it is. It's putting your faith in the one true seed that the promise was given to. Abraham and to his seed, and he tells you who the seed is. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So if we go back to Genesis chapter number 12, and we allow the Bible to define the Bible, we allow the Bible to be our final authority, when God says to Abram in Genesis 12, verse number 2 and 3, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We compare this to Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and we see that this promise was given to Abraham and to his seed. What does the New Testament tell us was preached unto Abraham? The gospel. There's no way out of it. The gospel was preached to Abraham. This promise was not given just to all of the physical descendants of you know, uh, Abraham, and we can look at verses in Romans, but I'm not going to hammer this that much. It's going to be brought up again later. We can look at verses all throughout 
the, the, the New Testament, even verses that support this in the Old Testament. Many, many verses. But just from comparing just two simple verses, we can see in Galatians 3.16, Genesis 12, and you can use verses 2 or 3, whichever one you prefer, this promise was not made to seeds as of many. It was made to one seed, singular. Game over. No more argument. It doesn't, you know, all your support for, for Israel, it's done. Millions of people literally supporting Israel on a misunderstanding of a verse when the Bible tells you what it means. Right. How ridiculous. This should show you that you need to make sure that you study the Bible for yourself before someone else tells you or you go out and act on something. How many millions of dollars, yay, billions probably of dollars have been donated to the nation of Israel because someone misunderstood this verse? Because they got it from the Schofield Reference Bible. They got it from their dispensational pastor or teacher. They got it from whatever, you know, dispensational reference book. Just so much money people have blown. So much prayer for naught that went into this ungodly nation today. Right. Because that's what they are, my friend. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. They are antichrist. They are the epitome of antichrist. Right. Specifically, all throughout the New Testament, when the Bible talks about an antichrist, it's referring to the Jews most of the time. Right. All throughout the book of 1 John, where the most famous quotes come in for, about the antichrist, it's talking about the Jews. Being an antichrist. And you have all of these Christians manipulated and duped by a, by a simple reading of the Bible, a simple cross-reference, cross where the Bible actually explains to you, it's not seeds. It's only given to one. And if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are that seed. Amen. Read Galatians chapter number 3 in its entirety if you have any confusion about this, and it clears it up even more so. So let's move on here. <coughs> Genesis uh, chapter number 12, we're going to look at verse number 4 now. So it says, that, says this, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. The reason why, we're not told here, but the reason why he ended up departing out of Haran was what? What did Acts 7 say? It was because his father had passed away. As soon as his father passed away, that was when he moved. So what was actually impeding him? His father was. His father was holding him back, if you will. That's why it says, <coughs> if we were to back up in Genesis 11, it says that, that Terah took Abram, didn't he? So Abram obviously was called. He told his father about it. And then Terah, in, verse, uh, in chapter 11, verse 31, it says, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. Notice that Abram was actually called from his father's house. You notice that? God was not calling him, but, but Abram, you know what happened here is Abram didn't have the guts, obviously, to stand up to his dad. You know what? We're supposed to honor our father and our mother. But let me say this. If your parents are impeding you from serving the Lord, you should treat that situation the same way that you would treat that, especially if they're an unbeliever. You should treat that situation the same way that you would treat it with any unbeliever. Now, you should honor your father and your mother, but that doesn't mean that you allow them to make decisions for you. That doesn't mean that if you're a grown man or you're a grown woman and you have a husband and you or you have a wife, either situation that you're in, you do not just allow your, your parents to make decisions for you. If your parents are not saved, let me just say this. If your parents are not saved, you should not be, they should not be your best friend. That may make you feel uncomfortable, but think about this. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, I believe it's verse number or four, I think it is, where it talks about be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Where's the exception for parents there? Explain that to me. What's the reason why? Think about this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with, uh, with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what concord hath Christ with Bailey? It goes on and on and on, right? It gives you a couple examples. What communion hath light with darkness? What's the point? What are they going to do to your life? Oh, so I guess because they're your family members, all of a sudden they're not going to hamper your spiritual background. Well, looks like uh, Abraham wasn't an exception to that. Looks like in his case, what happened? His dad, whether he was saved or unsaved, did he help him? He did not, did he? He actually held him back from serving the Lord for I don't know how many years. 
It doesn't give you the, the time period after he was called and then when he actually came into Canaan. Could have been 15, 20 years of his life where he was held back. If your mother or your father is not saved, they should not be your best friend. Right. I'm sorry. That's it. You know, life is hard. And I can tell you that I'm not being partial in this at all. I have family members that are very close family members that are saved, and I don't talk to them. Like, very close family members. I'll talk to them some, but I don't talk to them all the time. I'm not saying you need to just never speak to them and avoid them like the plague. But I'm saying that I would never be best friends with those people, even if they're saved and they're, and they're worldly. Do you know why? The same reason why you shouldn't hang out with an unsaved person that's worldly. If you get the same negative influence from a saved person that's worldly that you do from an unsaved person that's worldly, what's the difference? There's a reason why you're not supposed to be around them because they negatively impact you. They negatively influence you. And if your parents do the same, they are not an exception. I don't care if your mother has been your best friend your entire life. It's not an exception. Now, praise God if your parents are saved and they are godly. Praise God for that. I mean, that's great. And in my case, my parents are saved. So I'm very happy. But I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, and my wife knows my personality, and this is true. If my mother and my father were ungodly and they weren't saved, I would not spend time with them. But I'm thankful that they are. I would cut them off, you know, to a degree. I wouldn't just be best friends with them. I'm thankful and happy that they are. I, can't, I wouldn't want to do that, but I would do it anyways. You know why? Because God should be the most important thing to you. The first commandment is to love the Lord thy God. That's the first commandment. That's the number one commandment. That's what should put, you should put first. But even if your parents are saved and they hinder you, then it's still the same situation. It doesn't matter what situation. It doesn't matter who they are. There aren't these just bipart. You know, they're, they're, we don't just. We're not going to be partial, right? It doesn't matter if they're hindering you. Then you then look at what happened to, to Abram. There's a reason why God gives you an extra detail in the New Testament that's not found in the Old Testament, and the only thing that He tells you was when His father passed away, He left. You go back and read the story and what happens? God calls Abram and then Terah takes Abram and them. It's like, whoa, 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 buddy. God called me, man. I want to go serve God. You know, there's a reason why he called Abram and not Terah. I don't know why, but there's a reason. <clears throat> so you know what? Abram should not have allowed his father to waste his time. Abram should, you know what Abram should have done in this particular case? He had a special situation. You know what he should have done? He should have... You know what he should have done? He should have left his country, he should have left his kindred, and he should have left his father's house. What God told him to do in the first place. Now, I'm not saying that the reason of that at the very beginning was that he was hindering him. I don't know. I, I'm not going to speculate either. But I can tell you this. When Terah took him, and he took over the situation, and took all the family, and was still the patriarch, he, for whatever reason, ended up stopping them from going into the promised land. Maybe he got sick, whatever it was. But you know what Abram should have done? He should have obeyed God rather than man. He should have left and he should have went with God anyways. Right? So if your family is saved and if your family is not a negative influence, you know what you should do? Praise God for that. But if they are not, you need to put God first. And if they are, are, are you know, uh, hampering or dampering your spiritual life, then you need to create distance there. And if they are negatively influencing you, then that is sin. You are in violation of 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. You are yoked together with an unbeliever. That's just, that's a fact. And your parents are not, whether it's your, you know, father, mother, whoever it may be, close relative, whoever it may be, they're not an exception. No one is an exception. God wants us to live holy, holy and justly. And we need to do whatever we can to do that. We need to put God first. <clears throat> So look at, uh, I want to point, point out something to you as well while we're here. Look at, <clears throat> verse number four says this, so Abram departed. So was he obedient now? He was obedient, wasn't he? He was obedient now at this point. Flip over to Genesis chapter number 15. <clears throat> I pointed this out one other time. A lot of people haven't noticed this. I read my Bible through scores of times before I actually noticed this. It's, uh, it seems almost strange on the surface. But if you actually look at the salvation of Abram or Abraham, it takes place in Genesis 15. Look at Genesis 15, verse 
5 and 6 again. We read this a moment ago. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So when did Abraham get saved? Verse 6. Proof that this is in chronological order. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. Chronological order. This took place after he was called. Go back to Genesis chapter number 12. So you look there when it says in verse number 4, so Abram departed. Now, so I want you to think about this. Was Abram at this point, was he obedient to God? He was, but was he saved? So being obedient to God, does that, is that what gets you saved? Is that what gives you righteousness? It does not. So he was called of God, and God had a special job for Abraham. So here's the thing we also have to understand. This is a special case. You know, God doesn't come to every person that's about to get saved and come to him and say, hey, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, right. you know, unto a land that I will show thee, right? That doesn't happen to everyone, right? So this is a special case. It's like Paul, he's a chosen vessel unto him, right? This is very, very, very different. Abraham is one of the most popular people outside of David and Jesus in the entire Bible. He's super popular, right? He is like what's considered, like I said, everything starts to become very, you know, more uh, uh, related or relative to us now. He's what's considered, you know, the father of the promise, kind of. You understand what I'm saying by that? The promise was given previously, but now it's starting to be given in its clarity. And, and he really starts dealing specifically and with mankind and working out the promise of the Messiah at this point. But notice he was obedient before he was even saved. He was obeying God's commandments before he was ever even righteous. Right? He's not even a saved man. He's not even a Christian at this moment, is he? He's not. Now, that may seem strange to you on the surface, surface, but it's what the Bible teaches. There's no way around this, right? You see that clearly, right? After these things. You know, this proves that people can look like a Christian and not even be saved. People can obey the commandments of God and not even be saved. They cannot, they, that does not mean that they are a righteous person. Somebody can come in and sit in these seats for years and not even be saved. Everybody's like, oh crap, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but really, people can look the part, play the part, maybe even think to themselves. You know what I mean? People, most of the people that I knock on the door that tell me they're a Christian, they're sincere. They think they're going to heaven, but they don't understand the gospel. And that's obviously what's going on with Abram at this point. He receives the gospel, and what did I say? In more clarity. So right here, it starts becoming more clear, but if you look at Genesis 15, it's even more clear. And you look at Genesis 17, guess what? It's even more clear. God get, preached the gospel unto him again, and it was just more clear. So he obviously understood it later. What impeded him? Was it that he didn't want to get saved? I mean, he's obeying God. He's leaving his land and going, right? He obviously hadn't understood it yet. That's what makes the difference in a person, you know, being saved if they want to believe. Maybe they just don't understand it yet. Further, <coughs> to make this even more you know, interesting, look at verse, <coughs> look at verse uh, let's read the, the rest of verse 4 down to verse 8. So it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So remember, that was when his father died, is what caused him to finally leave. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered. It makes it sound like they were there for quite a while, doesn't it? <clears throat> They're completely packing up and just leaving. And the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan they came. The Bible's language is beautiful. Verse 6. And Abram passed through the land and the land of Sikkim under the, vow, under the plain of Morik. And the Canaanite was then in the land. <clears throat> Verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord, <coughs> who appeared unto him. Notice, is Abram saved? He's not. He even built an altar unto the Lord. He's building an altar unto the Lord. And at this point, and God told him, hey, unto your seed I'll give you. I'm going to give this land unto you. Look at verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. He's building a second altar. He's not saved. Look at all the works that he's doing. He left his entire land, his family, everything. He packed up and moved away. Let that set into you. We don't live in a different world now or a different reality. My point is this happens today. 
People that may look saved are not saved. I'm not telling you to start suspecting people. Just ask them and they'll tell you whether they're saved. Right. If you would have asked Abraham, he wouldn't have understood the gospel at this point. In clarity. I'm going to show you that further. Look at the end of verse 8. And pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And then it says, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. The last phrase there, look at this. And called upon the name of the Lord. What else did he do? Called upon the name of the Lord. Guess what? He's not saved. He's still not saved. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? It just means to pray to God. That's all that means. To call upon God's name is just to say, Jehovah, or now, of course, in the New Testament, Jesus. I'm calling upon God's name. Jesus, please help me. Lord, please help me. Jehovah, this is a sacrifice I made unto you. Bless me. Please keep your promise unto me. I don't know what he said, but he called upon the name of the Lord. There are many people today in Christianity that call upon the name of the Lord. They pray often. They're not saved. There are many people today that are, that are even Catholics, that are non-denom Christians, that are Baptists, that are not saved today. They pray to God oft. They pray to Him all the time. And guess what? They're not saved. All the time. You know why? Because they're not trusting the gospel. That's why. They have not believed on the Lord. What was the difference? What took place in Genesis 15? It says he believed the Lord. He believed on the Lord, didn't he? And he counted up to him for righteousness. So, had he done that prior? He hadn't. For whatever reason. I don't know the exact name. You know what? And here's the thing. We go to people's door all the time. And they explain to us what they <coughs> believe. We explain to them, that's not what the Bible teaches. Let me show you. We go through the gospel. And then sometimes people will say at the end, I've said that prayer before. I've done that before. I've called upon the name of the Lord before. But you know what the thing is? Yeah, but let me ask you this. At the moment that you prayed to him, were you, were you putting all of your faith in him? The prayer doesn't save you. The, the belief is what saves you. Right. If someone says the prayer, dear Jesus, even if they understand the gospel all the way, even if they, they believe it's only by faith, but they say the prayer and they're, they're, they're hesitant for whatever reason and they don't want to change their mind. And they're thinking in their mind, my whole family's Mormon, I can't do this. But they just go through the motions. That happens. And they just say, dear Jesus, please save me. And they're just going through the motions. I know that you died, was buried, rose again. I know it's by faith. They know all these things. They call upon the name of the Lord just like Abram did. But they're not saved. Because what saved Abram? He believed the Lord and he accounted him for righteousness. People build altars, people pack up and leave and move and go to a church, maybe even the right church sometimes. That doesn't make you saved. You can be obedient to God your whole life. That does not save you. You can pray to God all the time. That does not save you. Pray three times a day like Daniel. It's not going to do anything for you. Faith alone is what saves you. And if you don't have the faith, you're not saved, period. I don't care how much works you have. I don't care what you've done in your life. If you have not believed on the Lord, you're not saved. You can pray that prayer a million times, but if in your heart you're not trusting Christ, you're not saved and never will be until you do. That's what it comes down to. So as I kind of got on this last week, it's important to understand the purpose of the prayer and why we call upon the name of the Lord. And it is biblical. And the Bible ties that prayer with salvation, whether you like that or not. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Period. So that takes place at the moment of salvation. But the belief is what saves you. The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is what saves you. That is what gives you salvation. That is what gives you righteousness. You know, here we have Abram praying the prayer and not being saved. Not being saved. Why? What takes place in Genesis 15. I want to hammer it. He believed the Lord and he accounted him for righteousness. So what was missing when he, per when he prayed to him? Faith. Anyone doesn't get saved they say, and they say that prayer, you can bet your bottom dollar they just didn't believe it. Or they just didn't choose to put their faith in Christ. Even if they thought that that was the true way to heaven, they can still say, <coughs> I'm too scared to do this right now. How many people have you preached the gospel to that you feel very confident that they know that this is the truth? You can see a change in them. Their mannerisms and everything, they get nervous or whatever it may be. But then they say at the end, I'm not ready to do this right now. I'm not ready to make this decision. Maybe I'll do this later. And then they walk away. You and I both know that that person believed that that was a true way of salvation. But did they choose to put their trust on the Lord Jesus Christ? They did not. Now, I'm not saying you have to make <coughs> an audible prayer. 
But you have to make the decision in your mind, I'm trusting Jesus right now. Amen. Whether you even direct this specifically to Jesus. Like, you, I don't even believe you have to say, Jesus. If you just say, I'm believing on the Son of God right now for my salvation. And you understand eternal security all that, you're saved. You just call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Amen. And you can, because here's the thing, the reason why you did that was because you know that he hears you. So in, even in an indirect way, you're praying to him, if you understand what I'm saying. You may not have formally had said, dear Jesus. I'm now asking you for salvation. You don't have to just like, you know, you understand what I'm saying? You're saying that because you know saying this is saving you because you know that he hears you. That's the point. So you are still calling upon his name whether you like it or not. If whether you, you want to try to avoid calling upon the name of the Lord, it's biblical. It's biblical, but the faith is what saves. That is what saves you. And Abram was not saved, even though he did all these great works. That further proves that you cannot look at someone and tell whether they are saved. It's like what Jesus and the Nicodemus had the conversation, you know, and when he's telling them, look, like, thou art a master in Israel, no, it's not these things. He, one thing he says to them is he says uh, something along the lines of, you know, the, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but know, but know it not whither it goeth, and, or uh, where it goes and whither it cometh, something along those lines. And then he says, so are they which are born of the Spirit. What's he saying? You can't look at someone and tell whether they're born of the Spirit. You can't look at them and know that they're born again. What does that mean? Well, if works followed, that wouldn't make sense. If you just could say, oh, look at the great works that this guy did. Well, then, that, then what Jesus said made zero sense. He's saying you can't look at someone and tell who's born of the Spirit. Because it's just faith. That's all that it is that saves you. And you may have the works and you might, might not have the works. And guess what? You may have the works and not be saved too, just like Abram. It's, it's also just like when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they asked Tell us, when's the kingdom coming? And he says, you know, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And what's he tell him after that? What does he say he's talking about? Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What's he talking about? The spirit. So are they which are born of the spirit. Saying it doesn't come with observation. When you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit, right? That's what he's talking about. You know, when the Bible talks about the kingdom of God, very often that phrase is specific to the Holy Spirit. Very often, obviously, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are interchangeable, but very often when you look up that phrase, it, it will talk about things of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, things along those lines. So he says, it doesn't come with observation. You can't look and see whether someone's saved or not. You can't tell. And then he says, the wind blows where it wants. You hear the sound, but you don't know where it's going and you know, where it's coming from. So are they that are born of the Spirit. I mean, you can look at somebody who has the works, they might not be saved. And guess what? You can look at somebody who don't have the works, and they might be saved. Because works don't save you, and it's not an evidence either. Right. It's only by faith. Amen. You can pray that prayer and not be saved. It, that doesn't mean anything. You can move from one place to another to attend a good church. doesn't mean you're saved. doesn't matter. What matters is faith. Faith is the only thing that saves. What saved Abraham? He believed the Lord and was counted him for righteousness. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt. That he said unto Sarai, his wife. Behold now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians sh shall see thee. That they shall say... This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will, say, but they will save thee alive. <coughs> say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now, number one, let me point this out to you. Did, where did God tell Abram to go? To Egypt? No. What is Egypt a picture of? The world. Now, Abram may not be saved right now, but he's definitely a strong picture of a Christian. He's a chosen vessel unto God, and he gets saved very shortly hereafter. So he, at this point, is a picture or acting in the place of the elect right before he gets saved, someone that has believed on the Lord, right? And where does he go? He goes to the world. He goes to Egypt. This happens all throughout the Bible. What happens when we, we went through the book of, of Ruth? What happened? What did they do? What is the basis of the whole story of how everything really came together? We see if they moved, right? When they told to leave, there was a famine. They were not. And what happened when, she, when they moved away? They, they received terrible cursings from God, didn't they? Because they were never told to leave. 
that land was the land of promise. The land of promise, the same promise that was given to Abram here in Genesis 12. <clears throat> he goes there, things get rough, and what's he do? He bails. It's a picture of the Christian bailing on the Christian life. Picture of the Christian bailing on spiritual things. He was never told. And here we're getting ready to read this, and you may be familiar with the story, but it doesn't end up well either here. When you look at the story of Ruth, it doesn't end up well. Because when you get out of the will of God, you move away, you stop doing the things of God, guess what? It's never going to end up well. It's not going to end up well. And you know what happens when you come back to the Christian life? You don't pick up where you left off. You're 15 steps way back here. That's what happens. You don't just come back, hey guys, I'm back. I have the same amount of Bible memorized. My mind's just as pure and as clean as it was when I left. I'm ready to serve the Lord. I'm good at soul winning still. No. You backslide, guess what? You backslide and you got to climb that, all those same steps up that same mountain that you did before. So that's why you need to be careful. When, when a little bit of trouble comes, you don't just bail on the Christian life. Man. Hey, it's easy. Let me, this may seem redundant and silly, but it's easy when it's easy, right? But guess what? When, when it really gets hard, that's when you find out who's in it till the end. When things really get tough and hard, that refines you and that makes you that much more stronger than you would have been. If things would have just continued coasting through, you should be thankful for those little bumps every once in a while. Because it makes you into the Christian that you will once be or you will soon be in the future. You wouldn't be that same Christian. You wouldn't be at that same level if everything was just easy peasy all the way through. So we should be thankful for the trials and tribulations. God uses that in our life just like he used the situation with Ruth. And what happens? It ends up being used you know, to bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings this forth for good, just like Joseph's situation, very, very similar. You know, he ends up using that for good. God uses all that. He can use our trials and our tribulations if we don't run scared. You know, he can use them either way. But even more so, you don't have to make up for what you've lost. You can just stay right where you were, just as spiritually strong, and then also use that to be a greater Christian. When you, don't, when you bail on it, you don't get that opportunity. You just come back and then it's just that you, you bail out every time it gets difficult. You'll never be the Christian you could be if you fought through those trials, if you fought through those tribulations. If you use those and actually you know, battle with all the spiritual problems, you'd be that much greater of a Christian as opposed to the guy that just it gets difficult and he just doesn't show up. He stops coming to church. And that's what Abram did here. Got difficult, what did he do? Goes to the world. Goes to Egypt. Look at what happens. It doesn't end up well. Like, it, like it, it never will for anyone. Look at what it says here. So he says in verse 13 again. Say I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. And my soul shall live because of thee. Does this sound like it's a, it's, it's a godly scenario that's about to play out? It's not. Now, if flip over to Genesis 20. He's actually telling the truth. When he says... He's partially telling the truth when he says, hey, say that you're my sister. When he's speaking to Sarah. Look at chapter 20, <coughs> verse, verse number, pick up verse 10. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, <coughs> what sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God <coughs> is not in this place. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of of my mother, and she became my wife. So, I'm not going to say anything about that, but it is his half-sister that he married, right? So he is partially telling the truth. But what's the reason why he's telling her to say, you're my sister? Is it like, tell him that you're my sister and I'm your husband? No. It's too, for the intent to deceive, isn't it? Does it end up well? It doesn't. In either situation, it doesn't end up well. Now, God protects him because obviously he, God looks at the, at the man just in general. And in that type of situation, God will bless him. This is the same type of situation with Rahab the harlot lying. It's very similar. It's not right in any situation to lie to someone. That's, that's never right. It's never right just to tell a lie to someone. And that's what happened here. He told a partial lie, didn't he? That's why when people are sworn in, they're sworn in, in, in the judicial stand, what do they tell them? Tell the whole truth. What are they saying? Don't leave anything out for the intent to deceive. Because that's why someone only tells you partial truths. He wanted them to walk away not believing the truth, didn't he? 
Did he want them to walk away and think, I want, I want them to know that you're my half-sister and you're my wife. Is that what he wanted them to know? No. He tried to lie to them. And why? This is why it's important. This is what I'm getting to. Why? Because he wasn't trusting God, was he? If he was trusting God when he needed to do that, he wouldn't. Number one, he wouldn't have left in the first place and went to Egypt. And number two, it just makes perfect sense that he's not trusting God because once he gets there, he starts having to lie to try to protect himself as opposed to just praying to God and having God and trusting God. Right? What happened in the situation with Rahab? Why did she lie? Because she was trusting God? Now, overall, she obviously believed in the Lord and she wanted to do a righteous thing. We're all sinners no matter what. That's what you can't get around. Even when you've done maybe your greatest work in your life, when you're out soul winning, there's probably bad things that cross your mind. You probably accidentally say a fib. But does that mean that God just will not bless anything that you're doing? Think about that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So even in these situations, what God does is he looks at the man, he looks at what you're doing in his eyes. He's a perfect, righteous judge, and he knows what you deserve. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's why Rahab ended up being blessed in the first place. She, God, your intentions do matter to an extent. Now, it doesn't matter if you just like do something evil, but you're trying good to come from that, right? But if, you're, if, you, know, if, you're, if you have good intentions and, and you're just like kind of like trying to do the right thing, and on the way there's like a hiccup, you get scared or something, that doesn't mean God's just going to be like, all right, game over, you're cursed, right? It's silly. God is a righteous God. He judges things out and he sees what you deserve. Now, you may do something bad enough that deserves that. I don't know. But he's able to analyze the situation and figure out what you deserve and what you don't deserve. And sometimes he looks at the man in general and says, okay, I'm still not going to just let this happen or have this happen. I'm not going to just go ahead and destroy all of Rahab just because she lied. She shouldn't have done that. But this is what I'm going to do. And you don't know how she was punished I, I, either. That's not recorded. Everything's not recorded in the Bible. God may have punished her after that and not right then. Because that was a great story. God used that for a great story. But how much greater would the story have been if Rahab wouldn't have lied? And she would have stood there boldly and proclaimed the name of the Lord. It would have been that much greater, wouldn't it have? Well, the same thing with Abraham. Or Abram at this time. What if he would have just stayed and fought through the grievous famine? Because he knew God gave me this land. I'm staying here anyways. Or let's say that he did have a hiccup. This is the example of still doing the right thing while you, know, you make some mistakes, trying to do the right thing at least. He goes to Egypt. He gets there, and he's like, he, you know, he comes to the land, and he, and he just doesn't lie about it. Like, I know God will protect me. I'm here. If they come, I'll tell them, you're my wife, and too bad. You know what I mean? He just stands up for what's right. He almost lets his wife commit adultery on him. If you think that this is all right, you're out of your mind. That's about what's, that's what, it, what is about to happen. Let's read that and see here. We're about to wrap up right now. Anyway, so look there at verse number 14. It says, And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. <coughs> you might have thought that Abram was biased up until this point. Like, you're beautiful. When we get here, like, she's an ugly dog. No, I'm just kidding. But she obviously was pretty. The Bible tells you that. He, that the, the Egyptians see that she's a very pretty woman. Fair is like pretty or beautiful. That she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. This sound godly to you? Abram, because of his lie, was allowing this to happen. It's very, very evil and wicked. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. When I read that verse, I always think about it because he thinks like, like that, that Abram is her brother right now. It's kind of like the guy in high school who's like, the, he's like a year older and he wants to date your girlfriend or your sister. I don't have any sisters, but you know the situation. And he's like, hey man, can I come hang, up, hang out with you? But he's just there for like, I think of this when I read this all the time. He's just there for like the guy's sister. And he's like, hey, you want to take a ride in my car or whatever? And he's like just butt kissing. You know what I mean? This all happens all the time. That's what I think about because he's like, why is Pharaoh doing all this? Because he's like, this is your relative. I like her, so I want her to see me like you. Right? It's the same exact situation. So he's like, hey, you know, Abram, you know, here's some sheep, some oxen. That's like the, the you know, this is what's comparable to like the ride in the car here. You know, here's, uh, you know, some he asses, some men servants, some maid servants, she asses and camels. Just because he likes his wife. How wicked is this? And Abram's just like sitting back and doesn't say a word. I don't know how he could do that in the first place. That's weird in the first place. Right. 
But it says in verse number 17, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. <coughs> and Pharaoh called Abram and, <coughs> and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why sayest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to my wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Verse 20, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. So notice, Abram didn't learn from this. Another thing is, we saw, like I read in Genesis 20, this happens again. You need to learn from your mistakes in life. When you, when you mess up, you need to try not to mess up again. You need to not just do the same things over and over and over again in your Christian life. You need to try to get better. You need to, you got, if you have flaws, work on them. Whatever they may be. If you have trouble in your life, and in your Christian life, you need to examine yourselves, identify your problems, and try to fix them. Whatever they may be. We all have our problems. None of us have or will ever attain unto the perfect man. But you know what you need to do? Find out what the problems are and fix them in your Christian life. Amen. You don't need to just repeat the same exact situation to a T like Abram. If, if, if someone came to you and presented a question unto you and you gave them the wrong answer, and it brought forth very bad fruit in your life, you need to be prepared for that question. This is just an example. You need to be pre prepared for that question again. If you are in a situation and you made a very poor decision and it bothered you and you knew that it was sin, you need to be prepared for that situation next time that you're going to do the right thing. Make it your mind up and say, I'm not going to sin in the same way again. We need to always be trying to be a better Christian in right. our lives. I'm not here to play church. Amen. I want to be a better Christian. I, you know, and I don't think anything is impossible. I want to be a Paul when I die. I want to be a David when I die. They're, they're just men. I want to do the best that I can do. I want God to look at me and say, at the end of my life, that was a man that became a man after my own, own heart. That's not just something reserved unto David that can, no one else can ever attain unto. You know, we have free will in the same way in which David became a man after God's heart. You can become a man after God's own heart. The same way that Paul did all those works, he sacrificed all that, he went through all the trials and tribulations, he's just a man. You can do the exact same thing. Do you know what? One of the major things in your life that it's so important, it, you're always going to sin, you're always going to mess up. But when you do, make sure you're not, you don't do the same thing again. Or you're never going to get any better. How are you going to do that? Fix your problems. We all have problems. We need to examine ourselves from time to time. Like, you know, 2 Corinthians tells us to. 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves. Look at your problems. Pray to God and ask Him to show you the sins in your life. Read the Word of God with a humble heart. And you know what it'll do? It'll pierce you and tell you, hey, there's your issue. This is your problem. You need to read the Bible. You need to pray to God. You need to have a humble heart. And you need to look for the problems in your life, the flaws in, in your life the flaws in your heart, and try to fix them. And don't just stay the same. I'm just going to stay the same Christian you know, for the rest of my life. Well, that's a, that's a lousy, pathetic attitude is what it is. You know, I want to get better. I want to become a better Christian. If I made mistakes, I'm going to fix them. Problems that I have in my life, I don't want to have the same sins or the same character flaws, the same, you know, all the same areas where I lack in my Christian attributes. I don't want... God to analyze me in six years, seven years, and say, you look exactly the same, buddy. I want to be better. I want to fix those issues. I want to attain unto, as close as I possibly can, the perfect man. It's never going to happen, but what does that mean? You shouldn't try. Try to be the best Christian you could possibly be. Nothing is off limits. Let me tell you this. You could become the greatest Christian that has ever lived. Let that sink into your mind. Amen. People have this just like, this attitude of just like the Christian life. I'm not that interested. I'm just here because I love, you know, I know God's real. I read the Bible. That is not what God wants you to do in your Christian life. You have free will. You can be the greatest Christian that has ever lived. Think about that. Nothing's stopping you. You have everything that you need. You could decide tonight, I'm going to be the greatest Christian that has ever lived. Not because I'm comparing myself with other people, but I want to try to please God as much as I possibly can. Amen. I want to be the greatest Christian that has ever lived. I want to please God more than any man has ever pleased God that has ever lived. Amen. If that doesn't pump you up, then you are lousy. Right. Seriously. Amen. I want to do the greatest work.
works that any Christian has ever done. Ever. Amen. If you think that's ridiculous, you're ridiculous, buddy. That's right. Really? You need to wake up in your Christian life, like, he, like Paul talks about in like Romans uh, 12, I believe it is. You know, if salvation's there, we need to put on the, you know, the armor of light. It's coming, right? You need to wake up out of your sleep and out of your slumber. Please. You're not going to live forever. That's right. You're going to be 70 years old, and you think that you're just going to be like, oh, I'm very satisfied with my Christian life. I'm very happy with all the things. I, you know what? I did perfect. Not a chance. And if you don't have an attitude that you want to do the most that you can, you're going to have a lot more regrets than you already will. That's what will happen. Paul did not, you know, Paul was satisfied that he finished the job that he was given. But I guarantee you that when Paul died, he would have wished that he did things that he didn't do. I guarantee that he wished that he would have done more. I guarantee David looked back and thought, I wish I would have fixed that problem in my life. I wish I wouldn't have made that mistake. I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have read my Bible more. I wish I would have memorized the Bible more. I wish I would have prayed more. I wish I would have served God to a greater degree. Amen. You need to wake up. Amen. You are not getting younger, my friend. Right. You do right. not have your whole life you know, ahead of you. Don't, do not have that attitude. The Bible says that your life is as a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Right. You may have, and I don't know this, 10 years to live. I don't know when you're going to die. Statistically, someone in this room will die young, whether it's your kids or you. Someone hearing this preaching right now will die young. Statistically, that's a sad thought, whether it's my children, your children, or you. You will not make it to 40 or 50 years old. Look up statistics when you walk out of here. I will guarantee you that. Look up what the longevity is of the average people and look up everyone that attends our church and find out how often, whether it's young adults, children, die young. Someone's hearing this preaching and they don't have as long of a life as they think that they do. Whether you die in an accident, whether you die somewhat young from cancer, whatever it may be, there's only one thing that's going to matter when you die. And that's how much you've done for God. Amen. You can spend your time thinking about yourself, thinking about self-gratification, thinking about all different types of things, but when you die, it does not matter. Right. You know, and some people sometimes need to hear this. They need to wake up and, and focus on the spiritual things of life. Everyone needs to hear this. Amen. But they need to look at, the, at what, what really matters in life. What matters? When you die, you think you're going to matter how you looked your whole life. You think you're going to matter, you know, all the, you know, the, the sports accolades that you had, all the great things that you've done, how well even you've done at your job. Is that what you're going to be worried about? I really had a successful career in networking. I really had, I'm not talking about you, brother Josh, I'm networking too. So I, I was thinking to myself, I really had a successful career, you know, when I worked at that networking company. Who gives a crap? Right. Yeah, I'm 72 years old, and I, I really, you know, you know that, that one place, I mean, I, I really just, I did a great job on their cameras. You know, I install cameras for a living. You know, you, uh, you know I'm not going to name anyone publicly, but <laughs> probably not a good idea. But you know, when I installed their cameras and their network working, I built out their claws and I ran all their data lines, their voice lines. I'm 80 years old about to die. I'm so proud of that. I am not going to, I'm probably not even going to remember what I did because it matters so little. Really? You know what I mean? Who cares? You know what I am going to be thinking about? I'm about to meet my maker. And I want him to be pleased with what I've done in my life. I'm about to take my last breath. And when I see God, I want him to be happy. Think about that thought. You could be greater than David. Nothing's stopping you but you. You could be greater than Paul. You could be, you could be the greatest Christian that has ever lived. And if you think, that's so crazy, that's ridiculous. You, my friend, are not motivated. Right. Really. You are not motivated. If, that's, if you really think that that's out of grasp, then explain this to me. What opportunity did Paul have, or what skills did Paul have, or what did David have, or Paul have that you didn't? There are people that did far more when they got saved when they're 40 years old, 50 years old, than people that grew up in church their entire lives. So it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter if you had uh, you know, a, a, a divine spoon as opposed to a golden spoon in your mouth when you were born. Whether you were taught King James only your whole life, I spent the first 20 years of my life doing nothing. So there are people that could have, if you will, 
raised up in, a, in, a, in an IFB church and done just as much or more, or I could have done more than a lot of them. And, and if you look at a lot of the people that I, that I know personally, I'm much further than they are. And they actually serve God. I got saved at a young age and did nothing, but I know a lot of people that actually serve God continually, but I far surpass them. When it, I'm not bragging. I'm just giving you an example. I far surpass them when it comes to the spiritual life. You know why? Because I wanted to do more for God than they did. I was more motivated than they were. I just decided I want to start soul winning. I want to start memorizing Bible. If you were to talk to those people about mem memorizing the Bible, if I had told them, I have six full books of the Bible memorized, they would have said, that's impossible. Just like if you were to tell somebody you could be the greatest Christian that's ever lived. You know what they'd say? It's impossible. No, maybe for you, but not for me. Amen. I'm going to do the greatest that I can do. Amen. I'm going to be the greatest Christian that I can possibly be. And you know what? It's easy to become lax sometimes. But you know what? You need to get, you know, re, you, you reignite it. You need to, you know, every once in a while when you start to, you know, feel, you know, tired or not that interested... Your pastor needs to kick you in the rear end and tell you, let's do something greater than what we were doing. Amen. Let's do something better than what we're doing right now. Let's be a greater Christian than we are today. Let's build the church. Let's build ourselves. Let's just be a great Christian. Amen. There's Amen. no limits. Amen. There's no let you set the bar. You do. You decide how good you want to be. This isn't really, this isn't anything in life. But how much more can you do for God when you have the divine creator intervening, intervening in the creation that he made. When he intervenes and, and blesses you, how much more? You know, we think of secular things. You can be great at sports if you just put your mind to it. You can be great at, at anything, your career, anything. But how much more when God knows your heart and he knows out of sincerity and truth, I'm going to do so much for you. I'm going to do so much for God. How much more can you do when you have the divine hand of blessing upon your life? Decide you're just going to do great things for God. There's no limit, Paul. There's no limit, David. There's no limit. You can do great things for God. My children are melting down. Let's pray and get out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night, dear Lord. We thank you for the great motivations in the Bible. All the great examples there are not to be examples of, of people that we just can't be as great as, dear Lord. You know, uh, not comparing ourselves to them, but saying that they're not the bar. We're doing the exact opposite. We just want to do the greatest things that we can possibly do for you. Just keep us excited. Keep us zealous. Keep us passionate, dear God. Help us not to look around and become lazy. Help us not to compare ourselves to other people. Help us to say there is no bar. We just want to push and do as much as we can possibly do. Bless us and help us. And Help us to do whatever we need to do to build this church. And we thank you for the blessings of the many people that have been coming lately. And just continue to bless us and help those people to continue to come to our church. And to be blessed, dear Lord. And help me as the pastor to preach what's needed. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.